Why don't we honor the Lord? Father, we honor you this morning. Father, thank you for the glory you bestow upon us, but we give all the glory back to you, Lord. And Father, thank you for just round two this morning. <laughs> Lord, thank you uh, for your help here. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for all the gifts of the Spirit being operation, in operation. Father, we call things be not as though they are because they will be. We thank you for the open heaven. We thank you for all the gifts of the Spirit being operation. Father, I need your help. Without you, I can't do anything, but with you, everything is possible. Father, give your people ears to hear and eyes to see. Father, I declare that this word is producing 30, 60, and 100 full return. That what is being said here would be an eternal impact, God. Father, let healings and miracles take place as your word goes forth. And we just honor you. We, we intentionally just focus on you in the next few moments. Thank you for the mind of Christ being on display. Thank you for the angel of the Lord that brings revelation, that sent as a ministering spirit to help us understand your ways. So teach us your ways that we might become like you more today, Lord. What you, what you planned before the beginning of time for this day, let it be so. And we agree with that by saying amen. 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 Can be seated. If you have your Bibles, you want to follow along with me. Uh, We'll start there. I often say I know where I'm starting. Hey, listen, I just work here. <laughs> That's how you got to work. In the kingdom, you just work here. <laughs> People are like, you're in charge. I know he's in charge. <laughs> I, just, I'm just, I just punched the clock. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I believe to understand God fully and understand how we're supposed to relate to him, we have to begin in the book of Genesis. I don't believe that we can even understand our role, even as New Testament believers, unless we understand uh, uh, Genesis chapter 1 and the commission given. We can't understand Matthew 28 unless you understand it within the context of Genesis 1 and what Jesus was reestablishing when he said, all authority has been given to me. So we'll begin here in Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis 1, I'm going to grab my water because I need that. Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Image is we are actually given a divine part of God at creation. Every human being has been made in the image, likeness, and the character of God. Part of God's personality has been given to all of humanity. Why do we treat people according to how God sees them? Because they're made in the image of God. Why, don't we, why, why shouldn't we kill children simply because they're in somebody's womb? Because they're made in the image of God. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over all the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I think it was Charles Capps who said that means you have dominion over creepy people. <laughs> So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis, uh, skip on to just a few verses later, verse 31. I like this part. Then God said, God, get, then, God, excuse me, get, then God sees teeth. Then God saw everything he made, and indeed it was very good. So before the foundation of the world, God, create, uh, God had this plan, and he puts it into motion through creation. He creates the world, and he puts man on the earth as his divine representative. To see Adam operating and relating to God correctly was to see God. Adam was not a little God, but to see Adam was to see God. He was his representative. And in the garden, and when, God, and when Adam and Eve were placed upon the earth, a key characteristic here, we'll look at the characteristics given at creation, but in the garden, Adam did not have any of the concerns that we often live with in this world. He had no fear. He had no worry. He had no depression. He had no sickness and disease. He was made absolutely perfect. And what, what, what a key characteristic of the nature of God towards humanity is this. God is consumed with life. 
God is consumed with life. He's consumed with blessing. He's consumed with people living an extraordinary life under his banner and under his dominion. And the only concern Adam had was this. The only concern was this. I, I, get to, I get to enjoy you forever because humanity was created to live forever. Yeah. There's a divine sense, and also he was made with great significance because he was put as a steward of the earth. That's why everyone, every person, even outside of Christ, has this burning thing that they know, I'm supposed to be something. And so all, all Adam and Eve concerned was to enjoy God, live in fellowship with him, and discover things that he had made in the earth and extend the dominion of God. And here are some characteristics he gave them to do that that we just read. Dominion. Humanity was given the authority to have dominion in the earth. Dominion means to subdue, possess, and to take possession. That's a key part because from that moment forward, for God to execute something in the earth, he needed someone's agreement. God is in charge of the earth. He's just not responsible for everything that takes place. Psalm 115, the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of the man. Humanity was given the blessing of God. The blessing is this, favor of God bestowed by God. Favor is a necessary ingredient to understand. You have to understand that you live, if you're in Christ, you live under the favor of God. Thereby bringing happiness and invoking, and and, and is an empowerment to prosper. The blessing, he he blessed humanity, and and the blessing was given to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Fruitful means producing good results. Multi- mu- multi- uh, multiply is defined as this. To, to be multiplied, to become greater and greater. There's a grace on every believer to increase in the things of God. Yes. Fill, it means to consecrate. I, I, I like to use this. God forms the heavens and the earth on days four through six. He filled, the, the, the English word there is he filled, and then he actually tells humanity, fill the earth like I filled it. Subdue, to bring under subjection. Humanity was given the responsibility and the authority to subdue the earth and bring it under subjection. Now we pause here to understand something interesting. And it's this. I, I said this is the first surf. God, devil, they're not, they're not opposites. No one should buy that pay-per-view. The enemy is a created being. He's created by God. And if you read about him, he was pretty beautiful. Because God doesn't make junk. He doesn't make junk and he doesn't put stuff on layaway. He makes it the best right off the bat, baby. (laughs) And we know that the devil wanted the worship exclusively reserved for God. So, So I always say, God has an extraordinary sense of humor. I think he has my type of humor. This is what he does. He he doesn't destroy the devil. He doesn't destroy the angels that go with him. He like, I'm telling you, he wants to like torment them. He leaves them on the earth. And then he creates man in his image. And part of how man would function and part of how man would find its greatest joy and pleasure would be in worshiping God. So he's sending a message. Sending a message. It's like, devil, you're not really worth my time. So I'm going to create people in my image. And since you want worship, I'm going to make them to worship me. And everything they do, and everything that they put their hand to on the earth will be a worshipful act unto me. And when they worship me and choose to follow me, you'll remember every time that I am far greater. And I don't even have time to think about you. The enemy was meant to be put under your subjection to, to display the greatness of God. So humanity was given dominion, favor, and, a, and authority to, to, to subdue and extend the kingdom of God in the earth. And we know that the enemy came along, and this is why this is so powerful, because God binds himself to the choices of people. God cannot do anything in the earth anymore without human agreement. Neither can the devil. 
Think about it. There's, there's not anything happening in the earth right now that it is not coming through a person's mind or heart or faith. The enemy lies and humanity agrees with what the enemy says and so something enters in the earth. Death destruction and corruption come upon man, but they also come upon the earth. And for the first time, now man is looking to himself. What does, he, what does immediately Adam do when he sins? He turns inward and he goes, I'm naked. And a system came into the earth that I refer to as the Babylonian system. It is something that God never intended. And it's this world system that is this. Now man is trying to make its way in this world without God. Man is now concerned. What, how, am I going to, how am I going to dress myself? How am I going to feed myself? How am I going to take care of the kids? How, where are we going to live? The, you know, the taxes are going. All these things. And all these things in this world system, see, at the middle of all that is man himself. Man loves to worship man for whatever reason. And there's all these philosophies and isms that they have all been intended to only uh, replicate what the kingdom of God can do. Communism, socialism, humanism, this ism. They've all, they're all trying to get back to the, because there's something inside of every man, even though they're not born again, that says there's something beyond there that we must live in. Now, the good news is this, though. The good news is this. I always say, I always say this. God didn't need to improve on Adam. There was no virgin to, version 2.0 with, with Adam, but he actually did. Only in the genius of God, and I, and, I, and I hesitate to use that term because God is beyond genius level. He's like way, like he's really smart. <laughs> Jesus came as the second Adam. He came as the second Adam and, and restored everything lost to humanity that was lost in that garden. Through one man's sin... The earth turned, but through another man, the earth now has been turned. And now, through Jesus, there is a way where you no longer have to live in this world system. You no longer have to be governed by this world system. You don't have to be governed by fear. You don't have to be governed by trauma. You don't have to be a victim to anyone around you. You can actually begin to govern the world you live in through the God inside of you. And it's the system that, God, that Jesus referred to as the kingdom of God. But an important thing to understand here in, the king, in, this, in this world that we live in is that the Babylonian system has, a right, has the right and authority to operate in this world when the people serve the gods of this world. Luke, the fourth chapter. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I always jokingly say, this might be one of the few times, maybe, that he actually told the truth. All this authority I will give you. He's not lying here. He actually has legal authority because he was given it to by Adam. That's how much power God invests in the choices of people. Why? Because he gives people the ability to freely choose him he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He never created them for hell, but he'll honor their choice to go there. I will, give it, I will give it to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, you will worship before me, and all will be yours. And Jesus answered him and said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Key place, Satan has a right to the kingdoms of this world. There are gatekeepers in different areas and different spheres of this world. And what you don't realize is when you choose, even as a believer, to operate according to this world system, you are actually worshiping Satan himself. And then the beautiful thing is this, though. 
Jesus made us so we wouldn't have to live in the system of this world. That though while we're on this earth, we get to live in the kingdom of heaven. Though here on this earth, we have now been made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And all the resources of God now have been given to you to put the king on display while you live in the earth. But you still have a choice. You get to choose. This is how he put it in the Old Testament. I call, and this is a key part too about understanding the kingdom of God. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. Think about this again. Remember, God is consumed with life. I have set before you life and death. Some people think, they're like, some people live their life, even relating to God, waiting for like a lightning bolt to happen, waiting for a Pentecostal moment to happen, when actually the choice of much of the things you'll receive from God are yours. Therefore, see, he's consumed with life. Choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. For he is your length and length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them, and Abner, and all the Suarezes. Hey, I'm grafted in, baby. Uh, I have been adopted into the family. I'm in the, I'm in the tree. So he gives every person this choice to choose, even in Christ. And when Jesus came to the earth... He didn't come preaching the message, you must be born again. That's the evangelical message. It's real quiet when you say that. (laughs) But if you read the Gospels, which I have, certainly not an expert, but you read the Gospels, you read, it said, and Jesus began to preach, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, excuse me, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When you read the apostolic teaching, The original apostles, they preached about the kingdom of God. Paul preached about the kingdom of God. When Jesus, before he went to heaven, before after he appears to his disciples, he preached, he taught them things concerning the kingdom of God. Yes, obviously, you must be born again, but born again is just the door into this world called the kingdom of God. And for too long, the body of Christ has loved the door, but not loved the life. Mm. It was Jesus who said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached, and then the end will come. He didn't say the gospel we like or the gospel that we've made. He said the gospel of the kingdom. So I've been on this journey of walking with the Lord and trying to learn how to live this kingdom and how to learn to live as a participant in this kingdom. Though I'm here on the earth, I know he'd like to teach me of how to do how to do life like he does it on the earth. And I want to offer you this morning some principles of operating in the kingdom. Number one. You will never understand the kingdom. Even if you said a prayer to become born again, you will never understand the kingdom without making a willful, decisive decision to put God's kingdom first. Amen. The trajectory, the, you're, 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 I don't know much about cars, but I do know this. If your alignment's off, your wheels start going the wrong way, your tires start burning up too much, and you're not operating at maximum capacity. And much frustration exists because people take their cultural, familial, and nothing wrong with those things, their experiences, and they bring them into the kingdom of God, and they superimpose them on God. And they view the things of the kingdom in context of their own experience. And so they try and add godly ideas or godly words to the kingdom that they're operating, and that kingdom doesn't operate like this kingdom. But if you operate it, it changes the system of this world. 
So he comes preaching the kingdom, and then before, after he dies on the cross, he stands up and he goes, all authority has been given to me. What is he doing? He's restoring the ability of man who would come in back relationship with him to actually bring a transformation to the world. So he, he, let's look at this. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Really, really important because we, I don't think we can get beyond this unless we understand this here. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Let's pick it up. I always call the Sermon on the Mount one of Jesus' finest thousand moments on earth. Amen. I'm going to watch that when I get to heaven, Lord. Holy Spirit, Netflix, let's watch the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. Therefore, do not worry about your life. Again, he's speaking to the root of, of one of humanity's number one questions. How am I going to make it? How am I going to do? I got a burden on me. I have a weight on me. How am I going to survive? My kid's acting like the devil. My husband's out of control. I know no one that uh, you don't have any of those frustrations. Do not worry about your life. What you will you eat or what will you drink, nor about your body or what you will put on it. Is life not more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? See, what he's telling you is, I care about you. The kingdom is not divorced from any of life's circumstances. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly your situation you're in. He, he's actually not even mad that you made some poor choice. He's like, I want to help you with that. Amen. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? Why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown to the oven, how will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So there has to be a willful, uh, uh, definitive exchange in your life, even when you come into the kingdom. Peter said, and, and remember, when the apostle speaks in scripture, it's not like, well, you know, if you'd like to. We have to remember when scripture speaks, it's not giving a suggestion. It's an apostolic command. Cast your care upon him. So what you're doing is, Lord, I give you my worry. Lord, I give you my fear. Lord, I give you you my my job situation. I hand it over to you because it's not mine for me to carry. My bur- my, I, I, I was never built to carry this burden. I was never built to carry the burden of this world because Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And, and when you hold on to it, whether you know it or not, what you're saying is I can handle this situation better than God and he really doesn't care about it. Therefore, do not worry what shall you eat or what shall you drink or what shall you worry. For all these things the Gentiles seek. What's he basically saying? He says all these things the pagans seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I like this. All these things will be added to you. So many believers are trying to fulfill kingdom destiny with a world system mindset. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day, its own trouble. It's the first principle that really has to nail down in your heart. You got to make, and I can encourage families to do this. Do it with your spouse. Do it over and over again. Revisit the decision. Don't turn away. Go, and and every few weeks, go, are we really keeping God first in our life? Are we fans of Jesus who show up every six weeks and call this place our home? Or are we really seeking God's kingdom first? Gets quiet when you actually deal with stuff. He doesn't throw anyone away, but your actions will really display if you've really kept him first. So we must seek God's kingdom first. Second thing is, we must learn to receive an excellent spirit. Read this, Daniel the sixth chapter. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 straps to be over the whole kingdom. 
and over three governors of whom Daniel was one of them. And the sad traps might give account to them. I'll just pause there. If you want to know about someone who operated in a kingdom that was totally contrary to the world that he was living and learn how to serve it well and learn how to glorify God, read that book over and over again. I love this. So that the king would suffer no loss. Another characteristic of operating in the kingdom is realize you've been given as a gift to the world to serve the world around you. This is not a nice guy. This is a guy who's actually holding uh, the Jews in captivity, and Daniel is serving him well. Then Then this, Daniel distinguished himself. What are we? We're supposed to be a distinguished people. The world lives in this vacuum. When you're, we're like, we serve an all-powerful God. God's got all the answers. And yet, we cannot bring practical solutions to the world we live in. Above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought of setting over his whole realm. This is an evil man going, I know God's with this guy. I have news for the body of Christ. The world in America is not looking for Christian solutions to problems, but they are looking for solutions, and you have been sent as an answer in your realm of authority, in your realm of influence, a place that God has called you. Even if you are the lowest ranking employee, if you're in the kingdom, you have all authority. You can start, you're cleaning offices, start cleaning offices and go, every person in this office is going to get born again. Father, I bless this business. Stay away from the propaganda of this world system where people sit around talking bad about the company, talking about nobody takes care of you. No, see, that's another characteristic of operating the kingdom. You know that God is your source. You don't go to that job to have your needs met. You go there as a servant of the king. You know that the favor of God is upon you and it will advance you in everything that you do. I'm telling you, we cannot transform the world if we're trying to let them meet our needs. If we look at them as our source. So an excellent spirit becomes attracted to the world. Another characteristic is this, is learning how to utilize your faith to receive everything you need. There's a beautiful thing in Scripture In Revelation 13, it says, Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. That means before eternity, God knew what day you would live in. He knew the day that you would be born, and God rejoiced the day you were born. He said, I'm giving these people as a gift to the world during this time period, and they're going to come to earth, and listen to me, no king, no righteous king sends his ambassadors to a place without provision. Our boys are overseas, in my opinion, serving the will of God, according to God, defending truth, defending peace. We can argue all day. I I believe that's a justice thing. They're not going over there going, how are we going to pay for the bombs? Who's paying for the armor? Everything that you would need because you've been sent into the world as a heavenly ambassador, God has already taken care of you. One of the greatest lines in Scripture... One of the greatest lines in scripture was this. As my father has sent me, so I am sending you. You're a sent one. You're an apostolic person because you come to take ground. You're not coming to sit around. You're not coming to be overwhelmed and overcome by every difficulty that comes to you. You've been made to overcome. So not only did he seal your salvation, He sealed your salvation before the foundation of the world. He knew you couldn't come into this kingdom without his help. That's the brilliance of God. He goes, I know you can't make it, so I'm going to give you this thing called faith to enter in my kingdom. And there's not anything you can do to come into my kingdom, but it gets better than that. You didn't do anything to come into the kingdom, and you don't need to do anything to get the stuff you need to live on this earth. See, people, there's a disconnect there. They know they saved by faith, but they think I got to earn all that other stuff. Let's look at Luke, the fifth chapter. I've been doing this. I, I was, sometimes I'm real calm doing a little preaching today. Luke, the fifth chapter. 
So it was as a multitude, this is verse 1, pressed out about to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out from them and were washing their nets. Excuse me. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. I consider Jesus taking his boat there, taking what was already in Peter's hand. What am I saying? It's Peter's seed to his miracle. And he stopped speaking and he said, launch out into the deep and let your nets for a catch. But Simon said to him, Master, we have toiled all night, caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And I always use verse 5 tells us what it's like to operate in this world system. Toil. He's done everything he can. He's a fisherman. He hasn't caught any fish. So that's a little problem. Mama's not going to eat because Peter didn't have any fish that day. I've done everything I know to do. I've gone to the counselor. I've gone to the pastor. I don't know what to do. I'm taking too much medicine. I'm not sleeping well. I'm doing the best I can at my job. They still don't like me. The mortgage is due. All this pressure now is upon me. Yes. Go back to Genesis 1. Proverbs 18.22 says this. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no toil. Adds no difficulty. Adds no pushing, trying to make it on your own. Doesn't mean you don't work, you know. The Bible says a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. That's right. It just means we work a little differently. Amen. There's, there's a, uh, I've made a brilliant friend in Austria. No, Austria, Switzerland. Met him. When I was there in March, brilliant man, he told me, I've advanced so quickly. I'm like a, 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 one of the vice presidents in our company. And he goes, I began advancing quickly when I started spending every morning in worship, and I work a lot less, and I'm getting more work done. Amen. They keep wanting to give me... They keep wanting to give me raises, and I keep laughing because I said I keep working less, and, I, and the Lord will stop me because I work for my home, and I, and I just worship. Amen. He's a Joseph. He's a modern-day Joseph in the earth. He said, I have so much more wisdom now as I just bring everything before the Lord. Amen. I have to move here. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And when they came and filled, they filled both boats. Notice Jesus told them, Set, put your nets. Peter didn't quite follow it. He put a net, and he's about, this boat's about to sink. Listen to everything he says and don't add to it. <laughs> so they began to sink, and when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus saying, depart from me for my sinful man, O Lord. For all who were with them were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And also were James, John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said, do not be afraid. From now you will catch men. So when they brought their boats to land, they first forsook all and followed him. Now, this is really good. They're fishermen. You fish at night from what I understand. I don't want to get on a boat because I don't do that. I just, I, 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 like, I like running water. I like, you know, you know, I like internet. I like all the nice things of this world. And they've done everything they know to do to catch fish. Jesus comes along with one little word from heaven. And a fisherman told me recently, I was asking him about the story. He goes, no one fishes in the morning. The, fi the fish are not catching. They catch at night. So something must have happened. Apparently, Jesus saw things a different way, and they switched systems. And that word from the Lord caused all those fish who wouldn't come close to those nets to overflow the many nets that Peter had. Yeah. And here's the picture that God gives us, I believe, in here. Not only is Peter's needs met as a fisherman, but everyone around him's net is filled. He actually served all those fishermen around there. 
That is your job. I have more than enough. I got a more than enough sales. I got, I got my work done. You need some help with yours? Amen. And here's the beautiful thing. He doesn't, there's nothing wrong with this, but he doesn't go, here's the three steps to following me. Peter understands he's come into contact with a different world. He immediately, I got some issues, Jesus. He goes, forget that, just follow me. So faith is God's gift to you to operate in the kingdom and everything you need upon this earth, you can receive it by faith. But faith gets better because faith is God's gift to you in this world to no longer be governed by the five senses. If you live your life by simply what you can see, feel, and think, you will live way below. You will die with diapers on yourself in God. So part of this master master discipleship program where he goes, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He gave you the gift of faith to come in. We all realize we didn't do it on our own strength. Now he goes, now I've given you the measure of faith according to Romans 12 and according to Ephesians 2. He gives everyone this measure of faith. And in this walk with God, he expects that measure of faith to grow. Because he wants to teach you how to think differently. And you can't think differently without transforming your mind. You can't transform your mind without a gift called faith. Because faith is the seed to the transformed mind. Another apostolic command. Romans 12. Finally, my brethren, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. To, what's that? That's Matthew 6.33. It's another version of it. I'm presenting myself. Everything's on the table. Everything's on. God, if I'm thinking the wrong way about my life, if I'm thinking the wrong way about relationships, I, he's really good. He's 100% committed to delivering you from this world system. Why? Because it has nothing for you. It will make you frustrated. It will, it will make you put things on yourself that God never told you to put on you. Amen. It'll cause you to stay up late at night. Mm. When he gave you peace. Amen. So he gives you this measure of faith, and he expects that measure of faith to grow. And have, One of the primary ways he does it, the word of God. Amen. Right there. You'll see it in that story. So then faith comes. Faith comes by, according to Romans 17, hearing. This is fascinating, right? I'm fascinated that we're in this setting. I'm up here talking. What actually is happening is that seed is going out. Seed is going out in the airways. What you read on paper, it's, it's just on that paper, but it's a living word. But if you receive that seed and you germinate it properly, even, see, that's another, that's another place the enemy likes to get people. It's that delay thing. He tries to tell you it's not working. He tries to govern you by your soul, by your, because all he is a sensory devil. He ain't working, ain't working. No, no, no. You work the word, it knows exactly what to do. It will spring up. Though it delay, that seed knows to come to the forward and give birth to what God told it to do. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing. Abner translation, and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And the danger is in, in the Western church is this. Because we've been taught through the intellect. Nothing wrong with the intellect. It just has to be renewed. We think because we've heard something that we're actually living in the reality of that truth. And the measure by which we use the gift of faith to respond to the word of the Lord will be the measure by which we, uh, by which we will produce fruit in the kingdom of God. time I have left. Oh, I got a few minutes. Take your time. Take my time? <laughs> That's not what Pastor Glenn said. I got to take my time tonight. I'll probably lay hands on everything that moves tonight. Bring your dog. Bring your cat. I, I have, yeah, you can bring your guinea pigs. <laughs> I have. I prayed for dogs. He said, my dog's sick. I love my dog. I said, well, let's believe for your dog to, be, to stay away. Dogs are in heaven. Cats are not. <laughs> First Samuel 16, I'm not going to turn there just for the sake of time. 
David shows up. And Goliath has been taunting the people of God day by day, day by day, day by day. And a young teenage boy shows up, and it describes David as a giant and a champion. That means this guy has won some victories. He comes on the scene, and he's still taunting the people of God. And all these men trained for battle, they are in absolute fear. Though they've been trained to fight, they're in fear. David hears Goliath taunting, and he asks these guys, what will be done to the guy who defeats this guy? And they go, oh, you get the king's daughter, no taxes, and and this is what you're going to get. King's daughter's a good-looking girl, taxes, great, Saul's out of hand with taxing. (laughs) And I was reading that sometime in the last year and a half, and 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 I stopped. I said, oh, my goodness. These guys who are all trained for battle know something David does not know. But they have not wrapped their faith around what is possible. They simply choose to walk in fear, and they simply choose to to look at this situation through the realm of their soul. And they actually tell David revelation They actually give David information he does not have. Here's where the wubba meets the road for every believer. They hear a word that could change their life and their country's situation. They hear it and they go, can't do it. David hears it, wraps his faith around it and goes, I'm going to destroy this guy for Jesus, for God. What's the modern day vernacular, modern day look, how does this modern day thing look? All these guys had been to the Greenwich outpouring. All of them had oil, anointed with oil. All of them had been to the Bible study. All of them had been to cleansing stream. They fell on the floor. They rolled. They laughed. Nothing wrong with it. I love it. I like when gods get real out of hand and offends people. (laughs) But in that moment, they didn't understand their training because they didn't use the gift called faith. Every time God speaks, the enemy will always try and challenge the seed of what you've heard. Matthew 13. Jesus spends extensive time, even even when the word produces 30, 60, and 100 fold, according to what, what God wants it to produce, there will always be a challenge. Don't be conformed to this world. So it's saying it's possible to be in Christ, to be in the kingdom, have provision made available, but because you've chose to stay conformed to the system of this world, your intellect will stop what God wants to give you. I got a few more minutes. Mark the sixth chapter. Verse 1, and when he had come out from there to his own country, his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many hearing were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things, and what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hand? This fascinates me. Jesus is teaching, and when they're hearing him teach, they're going, Lord Jesus, who is this man? I know this is the Lord. Listen to the wisdom. They might have stood up and waved their hanky too. They were real Pentecostal. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Preaching some places. I know I'm doing good when the, the apostle will stand up and go like this to me. I said, I'm doing good today. I'm going to get the tape myself. But here's what happened. The revelation that they heard, instead of allowing it to transform their thinking, it overrode it by what they knew through their mind. Offense. Offense came in. Is this not Carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, 
Hosus, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters with us? So they were offended at him. Offense is so powerful, it can actually stop what God wants to do in your life. Verse 4, but Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. This is fascinating. Verse 5. I'm reading out of the New King James. Now, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in the circuit teaching. I understand in the Spanish translation of the Bible, if anyone has that, be brilliant this morning. But in the Spanish translation of the Bible, it says this. Jesus wanted to do miracles, but he could not because of the offense of their hearts. And that's actually closer to the original language, obviously, the, the Greek there. How is it possible that Jesus wanted to do certain things, but he couldn't? He needed their agreement. And in this world that we live in, in this kingdom that you are a part of if you're in Christ, it is not based upon your need. It's based on your ability to put faith in God to meet that need. So they're hearing words of life, yet the positioning of their heart shut down what he wanted to do. And here's often how offense comes in. When we begin, see, you have to be bold to walk this life in the kingdom, and you have to, you also have to be okay with things you don't understand. If you understand everything about God and every one of your situations, I'm telling you, you're living way, 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 way below what God intended you. But here's the other side of it. The enemy loves people to live in that place because it's safe. Yeah, just just serve God through your intellect. Don't believe him for anything. Don't believe things in your life can advance because, you know, if you believe him, you know, you tried, to believe, you, tried that, you tried that for a few years and, you know, disappointment happened and things just went the wrong way. And so just live in that disappointment. And so it locks people in. That's why you must purpose in your heart. I might not understand this, but I know that you're always good. I know that you always get it wrong. And here's a life principle I live with. I never allow the things I don't understand to stop what I'm hearing from heaven. So when you hear either the word of God as you read it in your own private time, as you hear prophetic words, one of the dangers in what I've seen around the world is this, especially in environments where there's, there's, there's multi, you know, prophecy, God's moving and stuff. People, if their heart is not positioned correctly, become desensitized to what God is saying and doing in the room. And they're like, oh, we've seen that before. Oh, Pastor Glenn says the same thing every week. Every time Pastor Nick, he always got to say that. Yeah, we know, Pastor. We know. We got that point. Well, probably, but he's probably saying it again because you haven't gotten it quite yet. And so that offense and that cynicism come up in the name of, I'm just keeping it real. Yet the Bible teaches we're not moved by the things that we see. And the things that we see are subject to change according to what he's told me about him. See, if you want to live this life in the kingdom, you'll have to resist propaganda. What's propaganda? I don't know. I'm not an expert on this, but I read World War II. You read, how does a whole nation destroy a whole group of people? They had a minister of propaganda. And he convinced people that the Jews were like rats. So you can kill a rat. You can't kill a person, but you can kill a rat because they have no worth. And propaganda changed the world for evil. What about truth changing the world for good? You receive this word today? Just lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus... I say that your people will not just be hearers, but they will be doers, producing 30, 60, and 100 full return. I say that the seed of your word will come alive in their hearts. I say that they will honor the word of the Lord and what they hear. 
I say that they will no longer be governed and earthbound to the system of this world, but they will see your goodness in every situation. In the name of Jesus, I bless you to see the goodness of God in your situation. I say you are fighting the good fight of faith. I say he's causing all things to work for your certain good. I say it's a new day for a new way. I lift off oppression. I lift off weariness. I lift off worry. I lift off confusion. And I bless you in Jesus' name.